Hello, everyone. Jimmy here. Grower here in Boileau, Quebec, where it is just a beautiful 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, what's that? About 70, about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's just absolutely gorgeous out there. It feels like summer and tomorrow is summer. So happy summer solstice, everyone. I uh, hope your summer is going to kick off in a good way and you've had yourselves a good spring. Today is the last day of spring. And uh, we're seeing those daylight hours stabilize. So for the next three or four days, the uh, amount of daylight is the same. And that is pretty cool. And these are the longest days of the year. So that's fun. So go out, enjoy, profit, like we say in French. Profit is that. Uh, we have, for here, with us here at La Ferme de Lobe here in Boileau, we have pretty much all of the fall, everything planted except the fall crops. So all of our cover crops are in, the tomatoes are growing, the peppers are growing, the melons are in, the cucumbers are growing. Everything looks great out there. The warm and settled date is passed, which is that date when the nights start dipping below 10 degrees Celsius, but are now staying above that. So everything everything is happy. The, the warmer that the temperatures are in the ground, the happier all the transplants are going to be, especially our tender annual plants. So now we're in the maintenance period, irrigation when we need to, and determining insect and disease presence, which, how is that for a segue, which is exactly what today's show is all about. Uh, but before I start, I think I want to mention there's, there's some real um, extreme events going on up here in Canada. Uh, for those of you who live in Canada, you know. And for those of you who don't but live in the Northeast, you've been getting all of our smoke um, filtering into your cities like New York and Minneapolis and Boston. Um, we are in the midst of just an absolutely massive wildfire season. They say it's right now the third biggest since they've been recording in the last 40 years. Um, but we are, hold on, let me see if I can fix the audio. Okay, hopefully it's better. Um, but supposedly we are very close to the amount of acres that have been burned historically in the worst season. We are already at 14.3 million acres burned which is just absolutely huge. Um, when, when we think of fire season, sometimes we relate, uh, North America relates to California when they have their fire season and their worst one ever in their history was in 2008, where 1.7 million acres burned. And as I said, here in Canada, it's over 14 million. So it is more than six, seven times uh, the size of what California saw. So I, I, it's just it's just devastating. And my heart goes out to all beings, no matter whether skin, feather, fur, or scale, um, because all families have been displaced. And it's very, very sad. And this is all caused by, um, here in Canada, a lot of it's caused by overlogging in our forests, which is making the forest more susceptible to outbreaks. Extreme climactic conditions, excessive heat, excessive droughts, unanticipated intense lightning strikes, dry thunderstorms, all of this is precipitated by more CO2 equivalents, carbon dioxide equivalents in the atmosphere. The number one cause being the burning of fossil fuels and the number two cause in the world today is agriculture, the main culprit being animal agriculture. So this is why we're here, right? We're here to talk about our gardens, how to make our gardens better, more productive, and how to do it without any animal products at all, without any animal exploitation at all. Uh, so for all of you vegans out there, this is a safe space. So let's get on to it. So we've had a ton of questions this week, and it's a huge show um, about insects eating our plants, because this is the time of year where we have everything planted and we're, we're watching those insect beings come in and chew on our plants or destroy our plants. And we need to know uh, what, what we need to do about that and how we can mitigate these problems. The first thing that I want to say, though, however, is that insects are absolutely, absolutely essential to a functioning ecosystem. Without them or most of them, infestations would be even worse. 
pollinated crops would not make fruit. Certain plants, shrubs, and trees would become invasive. Compost would not be made from the arthropods in the soil. And even though, even those that we deem as pests can be beneficial, but maybe and not necessarily to the crops we want to eat. So we need to manage them as best as we can. And throughout my journey as a grower, it really doesn't matter where, whether Arizona or Hawaii or Central America, South America, or here in Quebec, there's always going to be some insect pressure or some insect that is going to take predominance during every season that is going to like some plants and not like other plants. And it's going to be regional. Uh, what I'm going to talk about on today's show are from my experiences, the ones that have been the most uh, invasive, most difficult to manage, uh, and, and, and the ways that I figured out a way to, to get the crops to grow anyway. Um, so just know that even though we're not going to talk about every single one, uh, that could possibly eat our plants. What I am going to discuss are the ones that I really think one, we, we need to look out for as best as possible. And with the insects, um, I'm going to mention this again, a little bit later, we're talking about a completely 100% no spray of an insecticide approach, no organic insecticides, obviously no conventional insecticides, but nothing to really deter them uh, by spraying them, by trying to kill them by spraying them. We're not going to, we're not, in veganics, we really don't recommend do, using this. Actually, it's not even that we don't recommend with the North American Veganic Certification Standard, co-founded where we certify veganic farms. We just don't even allow it. Um, we, if any farms are using it, we ask them to transition over away from that. And these are some of the ways that we can do so. So let's get to it, sort of in the or relative order of the appearance that they will show up in your gardens. So, so the first ones are cutworms, gray worms. This is number one. They are the larva of a nocturnal moth species and can be gray, brown, or black and surface at night, which makes them extremely difficult to figure out what to do with. The moths lay their eggs before the end of the dormant season, so before the snows fall or before the plants just stop growing, and the larva hatch in early spring when the soils begin to thaw, when the soils begin to warm. They are most active then in the spring, so our earliest seedlings are most at risk. They seem to prefer sandier soils rather than clay soils, and they will snip the stems off many plants, including beans, brassicas, peas, alliums, and solanaceae crops like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. They're a tough one because they like to come out right when the new plantings come out. And even though they're, especially here, we have a lot of diversity in the wild uh, patches of our garden. Where we are planting, we try to keep them pretty clean while we're transplanting so that the transplants have an opportunity to grow up strong. But those gray root worms, as soon as they see something that seems, well, tasty or interesting, they're going to take a bite out of it. So observation is the best prevention. When a plant has been cut in the morning, dig around the base of the plant with your finger to locate them and extract them out. Now you can squeeze them, which does kill them, or you can just put them out of your garden and have uh, the birds go ahead and have a field day with them. But what I can say and what we've noticed, which is really interesting, if you do just put them out of the garden, they will start crawling back. So if you want to collect them and put them a little further away from your garden space, well, you can do that. And that's sort of a more benign, benign way to deal with them. Um, the way that you can dig them out is just go ahead and use your finger and dig around the base of the seedling or the plant that that little seedling that they're cutting. And usually the little worm is right there, right at the roots, right at the base. It might be small. It might only be a couple of uh, like less than a centimeter or it might be pretty large. It could be up to three. So take a look at them. But if you see some of your leaves being snipped off your transplants, that's going to be it. Okay, I'm going to have to roll on through these. Number two, flea beetles. This is a tiny black iridescent beetle that hop and feast on early amaranth, brassicas, mustard greens, radishes, and again, the Solanaceae family. 
Although they seem to prefer cool and humid, they can also frolic during times of extreme drought. The best prevention I have found is to install an insect screen on the crops they prefer. Side-by-side -side cons comparisons here at La Ferme de Lobe is that the loss can hit 100% under where a day, 100% uncovered where damage under insect screens is minimal. They usually subside once the night's warm and the plants established. So if you have a problem with, it, with flea beetles, you can go ahead and cover with a mosquito screen. I have talked about this on a number of shows before. They're very, very lightweight to let a lot of sun in, a lot of rain to come in, but they don't let the insects in or the insects that are trapped underneath like the flea beetles, for whatever reason, they don't like it because they are an arthropod, meaning that they will, an arthropod and a ground beetle, meaning that they will live in the soil. They will just figure out a way to get out underneath the screen and go off to some other place. They just don't like it under there. Colorado potato beetles, number three, are a large, striking, white, striped, black beetle with spotted orange face and will decimate potato and eggplant crops. The only non-spray prevention is to pick off the adults when they arrive or they emerge because they will also winter over. So they either hibernate in the winter or they will migrate in. And there can be up to three generations in a year. It is best to also remove the clusters of orange eggs as it is the larva that are the most damaging. I have witnessed for the Colorado potato beetles that if you leave the larva alone, if you have a laissez-faire approach and you decide not to take off the adults, decide not to take off the larva, then they will defoliate your potato plant in a matter of about three or four days. So it is best to go ahead and take them off to remove them. Um, as far as I know, there are absolutely no other wild flora plants that Colorado potato beetles like. They specifically came over from England. Um, they came over with colonists and they specifically go after the potato crops. They also like other Solanaceae, including eggplants. So if you have these little, little creatures in your garden, take them off. Put them aside, squeeze them if you need to. Again, veganics is not about a no-killing approach. It's just about of trying to mitigate and find the most humane way possible to deal with the insects that are eating our plants. I want to flip it and look at it in a different way. Because we don't spray, we're not killing any other insects that that have um, that live in the same patches. So Colorado potato beetle is an interesting one. There are Formula, organic formulations out there that are really powerful. One is called Entrust. Entrust is a broad spectrum insecticide, organic materials review institute approved for the use of, um, for the use in organic agriculture. And by spraying this on any target being, any target beetle like the Colorado potato beetle, it will end up killing every single other insect that is living in the potato plant. And we don't want that because a lot of the potato, um, a lot of the insects that are living in the potato plant are also doing our potato plants good by either eating aphids or eating other, or maybe deterring some other insect that could eat our potato plants. So it is best to not spray at all. Now, this, this entrust I was talking about, it's such a on spectrum insecticide that it kills over 400 different types of insects, insect pests. Now, I've been doing this for quite some time. It's been 25 years. I've been growing my own food and farming. This is my 19th. And I can tell you right now that the seven that I've listed or the nine that I've listed today and that I'm going to talk about are really pretty much the biggest problems I've had. So when they start talking about killing 400 different insect pests, well, it's just unnecessary because some of those insect pests really aren't going to do much harm to your gardens at all, especially, especially, especially if you have a diversified system with lots of flowering plants that will bring in other insects that will help create the balance. Hopefully make that sense. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, interestingly about the Colorado potato beetles and their larvae, if there is some larva left, who will move in are the assassin beetles and the spine soldier bugs, and they will end up eating the larva. So with the no spray approach, you will have 
other beings come in to eat those beings that they need to feed their families because some insects are just carnivores. That's just the way nature is. Okay, number four. This is actually three of them, and they all have to do with the same curcurbita family of crops, so squashes, winter squashes, summer squashes, cucumbers, and melons. Squash vine borer, squash bug, and cucumber beetles. All will infect, and with, the sal with their saliva will outright kill the plants in the curcurbit family. That's for squash bugs and cucumber beetles. Squash bugs can be hand-picked. Cucumber beetles congregate in the flowers of winter squash in the morning so they can be removed. In the morning when it's cold or the flowers are dewy, they just sit there. Now, during the day, if you try to go out there and see what's going on with your cucumber or with the with your cucumber plants and the cucumber beetles are there, as soon as they see you, they'll fly off. They're extremely intelligent. So it's it's next to impossible to then take it, pick them off the plants during the day. But in the morning, it's the same. Squash bugs the same way. They're very, very docile. They're very tranquil in the morning time. So go ahead and use this philosophy to, to take care of your curcurbit plants. Now, the squash vine borer is an interesting one because me, I've never had a problem, whether in Arizona or here uh, in Quebec. But I know that a lot of questions came over in the last uh, three weeks that were about squash vine borer. So here's the best information that I found for my own research. And this is something that I, I, I put out to all of you. Research who is in your garden. Try to figure out also on your own. In my book, if you haven't gotten it, the Veganic Grower's Handbook, chapter 13 is all about integrated insect management. I've actually changed the name from insect integrated pest management because insects are not pests. They are the most abundant, uh, as, a, as a group of species, they are the most abundant group on the planet. And like I said at the beginning of the show, without them, there are many things we just wouldn't happen, primarily compost, fruit from our fruiting crops, and creating a balance. Because if, if there weren't insects eating other insects or insects just there eating the pollen, if the insects weren't eating the other insects, the manifestations of insects would be even worse than what we think we have now. That's why the no spray approach also. Anyway, it all comes back around to that. So squash vine board, this is what I found. Can be cut out of the, in, out of the infected stems. Also, overwintering borers and plants will be fed upon by parasitic wasps, birds, uh, and birds, which will eat the moss. So a lot of agronomists will tell you with squash vine borer to take out your squash plants at the end of the season, take them out of your gardens because the larvae that are in your, your plants um, will hibernate over and in the summertime or in the spring the following year will then burrow into the plant. I say, and what I believe, and this is kind of my philosophy on most things, if you leave all of the plant matter on the beds, then what you're going to create is a, a habitat for the beings that want to help you control those, those insects. So if you have a squash vine borer problem, there is going to be insects that are going to like to eat squash vine borers. They're a little, they're a little worm and lots of beings like to eat worms, including ground beetles, including toads, including frogs and spiders and, and birds. And these are all the creatures that you want to have living in your gardens. If you take out all the plants, if you take out all the insects that they want, then the following year, if you don't have that, those, those available morsels for these beings to feed their families, they are not going to come into your garden. They're going to stay outside. They're going to do something else. The American robins are not going to come in and help you out, help out your gardens, help out the plants. So it's all a circle. We act as agriculturalists. Sometimes we act that it's not a circle, that we're in competition with nature, that we're always trying to weed it out or kill the insects or uh, what's happening to, you know, spray for spray herbicide for the weeds that are killing my plants or that are choking out my plants. But that's not really the way it works.
works. What what we are trying, what we want to try to accomplish in, is create synchronicity, create balance, create harmony. And we can, uh, but like I said at the beginning also, we do need to mitigate it by picking some of them off. But with squat vine borers specifically, leave your plants there. Um, if you really feel like you need to, don't plant cucumbers and winter squashes in the same place year after year. Make the squash vine borer move, travel. And by that travel, there's going to be somebody along the way to think of it as lunchtime. But all three of these on the curcuma can all be controlled by installing an Agrabon type row cover. And I've talked about this many times on my shows. An Agrabon type row cover is um, a very thin, lightweight fabric uh, that lets in some sun, lets in some rain. Um, but kelps create the heat that those cucurbit family like, keeps the humidity in the soil, which they like, but it also protects those plants from the insects that are migrating in or flying over. They just don't see it or sense it or feel the magnetic field of those plants. So they don't know it, that they're there. So they take off, they go some other place. Well, voilà. Um, leave that Agrabon row cover on there and it will really help you out with the insect pressures of these three specific insects. Leave it on there until there's flower set, until there's profuse flower set. So you open it up and you see a male flower and female flowers. Um, at that point, you do need to uncover because all cucurbit family, all cucumbers and melons and winter squashes and summer squashes and zucchinis, they all need pollinators to create fruit. Uh, so you're going to want to take off that row cover so that the bees and the, and the wasps and the hoverflies come in and the butterflies and the moths and all those, all those beings come in to pollinate your crops so you can eat all that goodness. All right. Number five, slugs. This is also another being, I, I had two questions on this in the last few weeks. This is another being that we don't have any problems with here. And I had no problems in Arizona. It was too dry. There were really no such thing as slugs. But what's interesting is they are here. They're here pretty much everywhere. Most of the spring, the late spring and summertime, they're here. But they just don't do us any damage. Why? I have a few ideas, but here's, here's what I'm going to tell you about them first. They can be quite damaging to greens and seedlings. And their trails can leave a slimy mess, so it can make your greens really unappealing. However, of all the small creatures that eat our gardens, they probably have the most predators. Toads, gopher snakes, ground beetles, and wild birds also all eat them. So since we're always working on diversity here, we're always trying to encourage more of these reptiles, amphibians, insects, and birds, and small mammals into our fields. Uh, we're always planting more flowers. We're always planting more perennials. We're always trying to create more habitat. I really feel that the reason why we don't have slugs is because we just have a plethora of plant material and a plethora of, of beings that are eating them. But the other thing that I've also noticed is that our, our fields tend to stay even though there are very humid at times, which is what slugs like, they tend to be kind of rough because we use a lot of chipped branch wood. Now, chipped branch wood is a one to two inch diameter piece of branch. It's basically the outer cuttings of a tree that has been chipped. And then that is a very fungal material that gets composted for maybe three months, six months, maybe up to a year, even two years. And then that gets used basically as a compost ingredient to our garden beds. <clears throat> because of that sort of more, more kind of uh, chipped, woody material that's in our beds, I find that the slugs like that more or less. I think they prefer a nice kind of wet, humid, kind of, kind of mossy, uh, maybe leafy environment, right? My guess is those people that use leaf mold a lot probably have more problem with slugs, even if they were here in Quebec. But because we use a lot of chip branch wood, all of our compost have um, some chip branch wood in it. 
even decaying plant matter is quite fibrous, is quite woody. They tend to not like that as much as, again, a nice kind of mossy or greens filled bed. I mean, it's why they eat greens, right? Because greens are nice and luscious and succulent. Um, I imagine if there were a lot of succulent plants around too, they would be on top of those, but we don't have succulents in our, in our gardens. We take them out. Um, so this is my feeling. My feeling is because of the diversity that we've created, we've created more beings that are eating those slugs, created homes for more beings that eat those slugs. Plus also uh, we use a lot of chip branch wood. So if you're having problems with slugs, try these things. Plant more, always plant for all beings in mind. Another veganic growing concept, uh, kind of a light bulb moment for me. What we're really trying to do is not just plant for humans and plant food that humans can eat, but plant for all of those creatures, right? Cool. All right, so that's number five. Number six, aphids. There are two main types of aphids. There is a, a green type aphid, can also be called a cabbage aphid or a peach, uh, no, I'm sorry, a peach aphid. Um, these will form kind of loose colonies. They will kind of hang out on the underside of your plants, of your perennials, even on your house plants inside, and um, kind of suck the juices out of the leaves. And then there are gray aphids, which are also known as cabbage aphids, which ca cause, create very, very tight colonies. Now, these are the most damaging, and they seem to proliferate when the soil is too high in nitrogen. Like when applying fertilizer to the soil, specifically chemical or animal. This is something I researched for my book when I was talking about aphids, but also something that I had always been interested in, in that when we create too humid of an environment, when we create too fertile of a beginning environment, um, this is when I've noticed the most problems with aphids. So what I used to do in Arizona when I planted, say, mescaline mix or lettuce greens, I, I used a row cover. I didn't know of insect screens then. And I used this, this very thin, lightweight row cover, but it created a very hot, very warm, damp, environment and this is what aphids like they just love that and because of that row cover with that heat it was all creating a lot of microbial and microorganism action in the soil which creates nitrogen as they move as they eat as they excrete they create a more fertile soil and that fertility makes for really fast growing crops but also makes for aphid population booms so the best thing to do if you're having aphid problems is use compost only. Don't fertilize in your fields. It's really unnecessary. It's not necessary to put cottonseed meal or soybean meal in the fields. Um, your plants will learn where to find the amount of nitrogen they need. It's only one major or minor element out of, a, out of 17, huh? nitrogen. Even though we talk a lot about it, agronomists talk a lot about it. Oh, nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen. You need 500 pounds of nitrogen per acre and you need to use this to bring in nitrogen. Or Yes, nitrogen does fuel green leafy growth. And for greens and for brassicas, this is what you want. But that's not all you want. You don't want a big green leafy tomato plant. You want a tomato plant that's bushy enough but has lots of flowers and lots of tomatoes. The more nitrogen is in your soil, the more green leafy matter, the more green leafy matter, the more humidity you are going to have in your soil. It's a better, it's a better um, vector for bringing in aphids. And once you have gray aphids in, your plants are they're just going to be sucked to death. So do not apply fertilizer. You really don't need to. Just veganic compost, live mulch compost, veganic made compost by yourself. Check my compost um, series. I've done two shows now this year and last year on compost making. And I created a special YouTube video on my YouTube channel here, Veganic Grower, um, to, so you can learn how to make your own compost. It's not complicated and it's very, very fun. But aphids are also a preferred food source for um, all ants. 
It's not that they eat the aphids, but the aphids kind of leave sort of a sticky sap. And the ants want to eat that sap. So they will actually do the work of corralling the aphid. So what you'll notice, especially if you have a sandy environment, is you'll notice a lot of these, especially right now, you'll notice a lot of these little holes around in your gardens. And those holes are ant hills, right? Now, it is sure that ants will, if there is a root system of a plant going right into the hole that they just created, they're probably going to eat down that plant. That happened to me in Arizona quite a bit with my bean plantings. They will create their hole, and in Arizona, the, the ants were big red ants, and they were huge like they have in Texas. And the mounds were quite big. They were enormous. So they would, yeah, they would eat around, and they would eat all those beans. But instead of digging out all the ants, getting around, what they would do, what they'll do is they'll walk and march and they'll go find aphids wherever they are and they'll corral them to certain plants so that they can eat those sweet juices. So let nature take its course. Let the ants be free. Don't worry about the ants. They're not going to do much to your, to your plants at all. Uh, sure, like I said, they're going to eat a few, but they're really going to do so much more benefit than harm. Not only them, but lacewings, spiders, ground beetles will all eat them. So they are a preferred morsel, again, for many, many beings. It just keeps going around that every insect has an insect predator, um, except, like I said, the, the adult Colorado potato beetle. I really just don't know who eats one of those, but everything else pretty much does. Number seven, cabbage worms. The white cabbage butterfly, butterfly will lay dozens of eggs on the crown of every brassica plant that she can find. So if you have a couple of broccolis, a couple of cabbages, a couple of kales, a couple of kohlrabis, a um, couple of mustard greens, she will lay in every single plant a dozen eggs. It is amazing how prolific this cabbage, uh, cabbage butterfly is. It is probably why she is the single biggest insect, um, single most damaging insect in the entire world for agricultural crops. It is because she is so prolific. A certified beginner grower from Spokane, Washington, Rhonda T claims that they can be thwarted by using decoys, which is basically a, a small toothpick with a kind of an iridescent white cabbage worm uh, attached to the top of it. And what she claims and what she thinks is that because the cabbage worm, when she flies by, or the cabbage butterfly, when she flies by, she sees that other butterfly and she thinks that that plant is already taken, so she moves on. Well, if you put one in every plant, and I don't know how expensive they are, I don't think very much, and if you only have maybe 12 or even 20 brassica plants over the course of your gardening year, this is, might be something to think about. I think this is really, really a cool idea because that's what the butterfly will do. It'll seek out the plant, but the butterfly won't. But if I won't lay because there's already somebody else laying or so she thinks. So it's kind of like a trick. And I, and I love that. Uh, I just did an interview with Our Hen House podcast this uh, last Monday, Monday last, that will air here in about five weeks. And uh, we were talking all about that, that it's just about kind of everybody's trying to outwit everybody else. The deer are trying to outwit us by getting into our gardens, the ground squirrels of California and here the ground hogs are all trying to get through our fences to eat all of our strawberries. Um, and we're just trying to do the same. As beginner growers, we're just trying to figure out a way to make it through the season. So, I mean, I don't, I don't mind if the cabbage worms live and the cabbage butterflies live. They can live wherever they want. Just not on my brassica plants. Because if I don't get a broccoli to come in, if I don't get a cabbage to come in, if they end up uh, laying their eggs in there, they will lay... Tw those those eggs will hatch and 12 little larvae will come out and they will just decimate the broccoli plant. You won't get a broccoli head. You won't get a cabbage head. You won't get a cauliflower head. If I don't get that, then I have to buy it. And I know that if I buy it, it is not grown with the same ethical standard that I wish as a beginner grower. It's not food grown in the least exploitative way. 
So we need to figure out and mitigate. Now, since it's impossible to try to catch all the cabbage butterflies and it's almost just as impossible to then wait until she lays and then pick off all the little worms because it's deep, deep, deep in the crown and they start really, really small and get really big really quickly. And they do so by eating the cabbage leaves. The very, very, very best method is to keep on insect netting all the way through the life cycle of the brassica plant. Uh, so in insect netting, again, it's really like a mosquito screen that you would wear. It's white though, instead of black, which is better. And uh, you install it with a series of metal hoops, hold it down with sandbags or rocks or dirt, and you just keep it on there until it's time to harvest. When, it's, when kale gets big enough, they're less damaging. When kohlrabi is starting to pull on their little bulbs that are, you know, about that size, then it's less damaging. So then they're less damaging. The other thing that you can try is what's called a trap crop. This is a really interesting concept where instead of putting an insect netting on all of your plants, you leave a couple out. And their preference, for whatever reason, seems to be bok choy, which is a very fast-growing, in-the-spring plant, gets quite big, quite fast, if you look for a big variety. And she will lay, doesn't seem like just one, but more, because there's sort of multiple bok choy, the way it grows, it's like a vase, but there's multiple little vases that are coming out. So as the main vase, and there's more branches coming out like this. And she likes to lay in every single one. Um, so this works as a great trap crop. And then you just let it go. And then it doesn't matter. And then she just eats, you keep some of your bok choy covered. This one's you go ahead and uh, and you leave it on the outside. So just as it goes, one last time about the no spray philosophy that we incorporate as veganic growers and that we're instilling through certifiedveganic.org. By spraying any type of deterrent, no matter how benign you think it is, will thwart those insects that predate on those that are eating your crops. Because it can be effective to spray. You will kill some insects or you will repel them. But you're also, but imagine if you repel the aphids away from your, from your crops or from all the crops, then the beings that eat the aphids won't come. They won't even try. They'll see that there is nothing there and they'll move on and they won't come back. And this is an interesting dilemma I had also back in Arizona when I used to spray safer soap on my mescaline greens because I used to have so many aphids. It was never 100% effective. There was always going to be a good percentage, 10%, 15% that remained. And then they would just do as much damage as if I had 100%. Meaning like basically it's unsaleable. You can't sell... As, a, as someone who wishes to sell, you can't sell your greens with aphids in it. I mean, you see it now. You see organic produce that you buy from the grocery store during the off season. Say you're buying broccoli and you'll see that there's gray aphid colonies in there. Well, this is unnecessary. It's unnecessary to be sold that way. It's unnecessary to harvest it that way. You should be able to keep them out. And... The other thing about that is, is that when you do spray, um, you're basically destroying that entire balance that you've been trying to create all along. So don't spray. Makes it very simple. The least intrusive and most humane way is to pick them off or hide them under cover or like Rhonda T does, put the little cabbage moth decay, which is really neat. All right. Is there any questions? Haven't seen any comments come over, so... If there's no questions, I will continue on. If there is a question, you can pop it and I will answer it. But moving on, um, do I need to make a note? Let me make a note on time. Disease and nutrient deficiencies. Okay. So disease and, dis disease and nutrient deficiencies. Let me have water. My throat is extremely dry. Okay, so in my book, again, chapter 14 is all about managing plant diseases. Diseases and nutrient deficiencies, 95% will come from the soil being too damp. Cold and damp soils mean the plants are struggling to uptake nutrients 
that help protect them against bacterial, fungal, and viral from insect issues that live basically in all soils. You can think of soil since we, we need to look at soil as the living soil and it's, and it's made up of microorganisms that are constantly changing over the course of the year. There's going to be bacteria in there, there's funguses in there, and there's going to be viruses in there from the nematodes they will be carrying them, as well as other uh, arthropods, ground insects. Just like in our own bodies, we have bacteria, we have funguses, we have viruses, but they don't come to the surface until our immune system is compromised. So the plants work the same way. If they have an, a compromised immune system, then that's when the plant is going to start feeling the effects of these bacterial, fungal, or viral issues. So the, the drier the plants are kept, the more resilient they become. When soils are saturated, even a completely balanced living soil, nutrients can leach away and the plants will not be able to take them up. I know that some of us live in places where we have an inundations of rain. Last year, we had so much rain in the summertime that I was surprised that any of the plants grew at all. They are extremely resilient. However, they will do whatever they can do to go to flower, go to seed, which is what they're trying to do, go to flower, to fruit, to seed. What we are talking about now then is not irrig over irrigating, over watering our plants once they're planted. Plants can go exceptionally dry, more than you think would be absolutely possible. They can go so dry, in fact, that you could probably uh, on, say, a, a tomato plant that's six feet tall, you could put your arm in the soil all the way down to your elbow. So that's about almost two feet. And if there is moisture at the end of your fingertip, at the end of that two feet, it is enough. That is how dry plants can be at a certain stage in your life, now, of their life. Now, when they're small, obviously, they need a lot of water to establish. But when they're bigger, they don't. So there you go. So moral of the story, once the seeds have sprouted, transplants start rooting in, limit water as much as possible, when and if possible. Again, we can't do anything about the rain. We do want rain during our growing season. There's nothing better for gardens than rain, rainfall. Um, but we want to make sure that uh, we are limiting the amount of irrigation that we give them, that the amount of water that we're actually personally giving them. And that will help them uptake nutrients. And I talk all about that in chapter 14 of my book. But here are some of the diseases and nutrient deficiencies that do happen to pop up every year, no matter really what we do, based on climactic conditions and based on what's going on within our living soils. Powdery mildew, number one, affects the cucurbit family mostly, usually brought on by times of drought, followed by a cold snap. So this one is an interesting one because it's not actually brought on, even though it's a mildew or a fungus, it's not actually brought on by the soils being too damp and actually too dry. However, it is exacerbated by damp soils after that. So the worst thing that we can do with any plant fungal disease is give it more water, right? We don't want to water it. We don't want to spray like a fungal feed on it, a foliar feed on it. We want to leave it alone. Uh, eventually, it will grow out of it. Most of the times it will. Uh, it does not seem with powdery mildew, cutting the infected parts out will remove it. So what I've noticed, especially here in Quebec, is that once everything dries out a little bit, the sun comes in, the soils dry out, eventually the plants grow out of it. And usually the fruits are not even affected. The zucchinis are not infected. Number two, verticillium will. This affects solanaceae, mostly potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants, usually early in the season, again, by cold and damp. Usually, sometimes here in the north, we're planting our tomatoes way too early, our eggplants way too early. Uh, the nights still might be five or six or seven degrees, and even a little bit more in the northeast or in the upper Midwest, if you're planting your tomatoes and the nights dip, below 10 degrees, then you could be getting this problem. Uh, what it's going to look like is a yellowing of leaves, kind of, um, kind of the, the, the yelling will curl up and it'll be the bottom leaves. 
Uh, the best thing to do as a treatment is to, for these, to take off those outer yellow leaves and let the soil dry out as much as possible. Uh, that will go ahead and limit. Um, you can actually watch, you can actually do an experiment if you want. You can take two sets of tomato plants, maybe three or four of each, give one just water every day, just water, water, water every day. The other ones, water only if, and when you believe they're dry to their root system depth. So if a plant is two feet tall, two feet wide, you can imagine that its roots are at least two, two feet deep and they probably are more like four feet deep. So put your hand down there, dig down. And if you can't, if down to your, again, down to your elbow, but probably just down to your wrist, if you don't feel any water, then you could water. But if you feel water, then don't, or feel dampness, then don't, because the nutrients are going to be uptaken by the plant only at a certain moisture level in the soil. So verticillium wilt will usually not outright kill the plant unless you continue to give it more water. So it's one of those conundrums as a grower when we're looking at our plants and we're trying to decipher what the problem is and we see like wilting or curling and usually our instantly in our heads we're like oh okay the plant is dry it's it's suffering it's 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 wilting even if it's a hot day and it's curled up and it's wilting but if the soil is damp it's not going to be able to take water it's not that and more than likely it isn't that and i learned this the hard way i don't know how many plants i killed in arizona because we get up to 100 degrees or 105 degrees with a 40 degrees celsius and i would just keep watering thinking that that would help. And in the end, the plants would just be struggling because they couldn't uptake the nutrients. They couldn't build their immune system strength by having limited water in the soils. Number three, aluminum toxicity. This is present in all soils as a major element when the soil pH or power of hydrogen is below 5.5. If you've ever planted a plant, and this is really, uh, it's a really susceptible, or the cucurbit family is really susceptible to this element of aluminum. So let's say you've planted a cucumber plant and it's just sat there. And two weeks later, it's done nothing. All of a sudden it starts to turn a little yellow, but it's just not growing. It's not putting on any green leaves. There's a pretty good chance that your soils have a low pH, an acid pH, and if it's below 5.5, if it's 5.4, then the only <laughs> mineral that your, or yeah, your only mineral mineral that the plant will be taking up is aluminum. It's really bizarre how that works. And I don't understand the chemistry of it, uh, but it will only take up the aluminum and that aluminum makes the plant phytotoxic, meaning that it just will not be able to take in photosynthesis and it will not be able to take in any more nutrients from the soil. So do a soil test. They're usually really cheap. You can get them from your university cooperative extensions. There are other organizations that do soil tests. There are labs in your regions, uh, whether in Canada, the United States, and you can correct low acidity in your soils make them more alkaline by adding either wood ash or dolomite lime, and that will raise the pH dramatically. Most garden plants wanna be between 5.7 and 7.2. Um, it's just numbers, but it means that they are slightly acid to a little over neutral, which neutral is seven, to a little bit alkaline. After that, you're gonna start having issues. When you're, when you're at 7.5, you're gonna start having alkalinity re related issues. Your soil is too sweet. And when you're below 5.5, your soil is too sour. And, and, and any soils below 5.5 for most plants, unless they're really, really acid loving, like say blueberries or pine trees um, and other kind of perennial flowers. But most things that we eat wanna be between that 5.7 and 7.2. Number four, boron nutrient deficiency in brassicas will cause malformation of heads. Uh, so if you've ever grown a broccoli plant or a cabbage and what you'll see is in the middle of the plant, it kind of looks a little brown. It just looks deformed, kind of shriveled. 
Well, that means that there's a boron deficiency. It's probably that there is boron in your soil, but it's just not available in a, in a way, in an ionic way where the plants can pick it up. So prior to planting, apply one quarter teaspoon, it's not very much, of 20 mule team borax. And it really can be found at any grocery store in the laundry detergent section. It's just 100% borax or boron. Uh, and you put that per plant, as well as if you have it, a dusting of wood ash directly into the transplant hole, and that will take care of the problem. So as the plant grows, the as we know from living soils, funguses will move nutrients around as plants need. But as the root sense that the boron is there, it'll hold on to it and use it when it needs to. It'll filter it up through the vascular system of the plant. And as it needs the boron, it's accessible. It's a very, very soluble. It's one of those fertilizations that happens. If you do a soil test, it shows low boron or no boron. Um, but even if you do have boron, we just do it as a... Um, as a preventative, because we know that our plants are going to, our brassica plants are going to want that boron to make the heads. Doesn't it? And a quarter teaspoon is not very much. We're talking yeah, that much. It's not very much. And so it's very neat. So a whole box will last you years. So it might last you 10 years and cost about $8. Okay. Number five, curly top virus of open pollinated and heirloom tomatoes. This is very, very prevalent condition in the warmer regions of the southern United States, southeast Texas, uh, southern California, and the southwest. It is actually caused by the bite of the migratory leafhopper, and you will see them pretty much everywhere. They're kind of a little whitish or grayish little uh, being that when you walk by, they just pop, 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 pop everywhere. Um, nothing you can do about it. There's no way you can spray for them. They'll just hop away. There's no way you can try to pick them off. It's, it's just impossible. But what they carry is um, they carry a virus in their saliva that when they bite the plants, the plants' leaves will curl up and die. Some years are worse than others. In Arizona, I had up to 100% loss of all of my heirloom tomatoes grown outside from these little leaf hoppers. And it does seem to be worse outside than in greenhouses or tunnels. So I could grow a heirloom tomato in, we have hoop houses in Arizona. I could grow the uh, heirloom tomatoes there and they would not be affected at all. So the other thing that you can try are to grow determinant tomatoes. These are the ones that are going to be no more than about two or three feet tall. They're basically a bush tomato. You can find heirloom varieties and they will do better. Something about the big bushy tomato plants is something that the leafhoppers like. And maybe because of the amount of growth, that's what causes their, their viral saliva to get through the plant really quickly and curl everything up. Um, so try that. Try the determinant plants. Uh, you can also try any kind of determinant open pollinated tomato plant that is an heirloom and you should have 100% success. We did when we switched over to that. Uh, when we realized that we couldn't grow heirlooms outside, we had great, great luck. So if you have this problem, give that a shot. We don't have this problem here in Quebec, at least not yet, knock on wood. Um, but I have had this problem before and that's what it's from. Number six, blossom end rot in the tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. This is where your uh, pretty much your first eggplants, peppers, or tomatoes that first come out of the plants kind of look black underneath. It's almost like they look rotten at the blossom end. Now, this is caused by a calcium deficiency in the soil. And just like when I was talking about boron, it's pretty specific, specific that the calcium is probably in your soil. But again, it's just not able to be assimilated by the plant. It's in a form that it is not able to be uptook by the plant. A sure 100% treatment is to sprinkle on every plant as soon as the fruits form. Uh, when you've had this problem in the past or as soon as you see this problem, to put wood ash or powdered dolomite lime right around the base of your plant just before you water or it rains the next time. And this will be uptook by the plant immediately and it will immediately 100% fix the problem. I've seen it happen here. We usually get it on our San Marzano tomatoes right away. There's some of the first. The Romas seem to be okay. 
but the San Marzanos, they will they will just create that bossum end rot, something maybe with the plant not wanting to pick up the calcium that's in the soil. So sprinkle of a uh, little sprinkle of uh, of wood ash from our from our winter burning of firewood and water in, and there you go, takes care of it, one hundred percent of the time. White mold, number seven. This is the most pathogenic fungus on cultivated crops worldwide. Targets over 400 different varieties, different, not varieties, actually different crops, different fruits, vegetables, and herbs of all the varieties. So all the types of basil, all the types of tomatoes, all the types of beans. It develops as a fuzzy white fungus on stems and branches, killing the plant almost immediately. This is the only condition out of everything that I've talked about today, out of all of the insects and diseases that I would advise to remove the plant from the fields because the fungus will travel from plant to plant. So take out the plant, deposit it out of the garden area, let the forest eat it, let, let nature eat it, let your green edges eat it. From experience, I have found, especially in bean plantings where white mold is really, really prevalent in, in all the Fisalis, um, in all of our bean crops, I'll think of Fabase, I'll think about, I'll think about the uh, especially in beans that some plants will not get the fungus when others do. So if one bean plant has the fungus and right next to it, it may not. And if you take the plant out, then you are just giving the plant that much chance because as soon as that wind blows, that fungus will just travel. It just travels right with the wind and goes right onto the other plants. These plants that survive, when you have, when you have uh, bean plantings, let's say you're planting dry beans or green beans or wax beans or whatever beans you're planting and you get this white mold fungus, if you are to take that plant out and the one right next to it was perfectly healthy, put on pods that I had no, no virus at all, I mean, no fungus at all, then this is a perfect candidate to seed safe from. And this is actually a precursor to the very next show on July 11th, which is going to be Seed Saving Simplified. Because letting as many plants as possible go to flower for insect, insect abundance insect and funnel abundance. As small gardeners, this is one of the most important tasks that we can employ to being food secure, which is saving our own seeds. And it really, really is not that hard. Um, so we're going to discuss all of that on the very next show on July 11th. Now, before I sign off, I'm going to tell a success story. And I, and I just think these are great. And if you ever have any of these success stories of anything that I talk about or anything that you recognize or observed and it worked, you're like, oh, I use row cover and it was the first time ever I had cucumbers. This is great. Send it to me. Send it to me here. Send it to me at my Facebook. If we're Facebook friends, Jimmy Videlli or um, wherever you can find me on social media. So a sex success story from certified veganic farmer Susan from Willits, California. She asked me during her inspection how to keep out rabbits and the ever-present ground squirrels out of her garden in Willits, California. Ground squirrels are a huge problem in California. I had no idea that they're as big a problem as they are. And what I had suggested was put up a fence, not only put up a fence, but bury it down. You should be able to deter the ground squirrels away. The ground squirrels are going to be um, very opportunistic. And if they can find a way in through the fence, they're going to do so. They're probably not going to climb over and they're definitely not going to burrow down too deep unless you happen to put your garden right on top of one of their mounds where they have tunnels going through and out. They're not going to create tunnels to go there. You can actually bury it deeper if you need to. The success story is, is this is what she did in the spring. She built herself a fence. She actually double layered it. She buried it down about 18 inches. She said it is the absolutely the first year that she's ever eaten her own strawberries that the ground squirrels haven't eaten. So a big thank you, she said, and she's and she wanted me to share it with all of you. So I did. So there you go. If you, if you don't have any questions, uh, then what I'm going to say is that the very next show is July 11th. It's a little early. I have something going on on the normal day now, which is, is the third Tuesdays these days. 
I'm sorry, I switched it. I was getting in conflict with the Vegan Organic Network uh, as they had their show on the last Thursday of the month, and there was no reason to have two vegan shows on the same day. So I switched it over to Tuesday. I, I If it doesn't work for you, I'm sorry, but I always put the playback just like I'm going to do here in the next, oh, about 45 seconds or two minutes. Uh, so I just... As always, I want to say thank you. I know you have a choice as to what to do with your Tuesday afternoons from 1.30 to 2.30. And it is, uh, it is a pleasure that you're here with me and that you're here learning. And as always, you can always ask questions whenever you need to. I love questions and I love to answer them. So peace. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful few weeks. And uh, we will see you again very soon. Bye-bye.